worked with Carson a long time on how to hit them high notes. Why do y'all like, you know, I can say things be very serious and you laugh. No, you had good reason to laugh there. That was Luke chapter 13. Well, don't we serve a great God? And uh, look, if other of you want to sing, uh, say, well, preacher, I'd love to sing, but I just can't. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, really, if, you, if, you, if you'll sing from your heart, and it's a solid message, and you'll just sing, man, I mean, hey, we get Brother Rouse up here sing with you. <laughs> and uh, I'm not about showmanship. I want to be real. I want to be, and I think things ought to be first class, but the Bible says make a joyful noise, right? So if you're happy and you can make a noise, that's all that matters, amen? And if you'd like to sing, you just let me know. We'll let you sing. Now, it's got to be a Christian song, all right? Uh, I think it was my mother-in-law had a, a bus route. I think it was her, and they were letting the kids get up. They said, any, any of y'all want to sing a song up here? It was on the bus. And uh, this one boy raised his hand. And so they let him come to the front of the bus, and he began singing. There's a tear in my beard. <laughs> she said, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. So that's not what I'm talking about, all right? Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 31 through 35 as we're, once again, we're going through the book of Luke. Now, look, I know we've been going through the book of Luke quite a while, and I hope that you're not getting bored with studying Christ. Uh, I'm not getting bored with it. I hope that you're not getting bored with it. Uh, for me, every week it's something a little new, and it's helping me to see the grander picture uh, as we go through this book. And we want to become like Christ. Don't try to become like pastor. Please don't try to become like pastor. Um, a man once told me, I'm, he said, what is a Baptist? And I told him, he said, I'll try to be a good Baptist. I said, just try to be a good Christian. All right, cause I know plenty of good Baptists that aren't good Christians. All right? So you just try to be like Christ. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Verse number 31, the word of God says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, Father, we need you. As we look in your word, Lord, give me clarity of thought and speech, and, and Lord, give us hearts that are yielded to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> we find here in this passage Jesus is still on his way to Jerusalem to finish the task for which he came, and that was to die on the cross for our sins in our place that we might be reconciled to God. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. He's given the blind their sight, the deaf their hearing. He set free those who were in spiritual bondage. He's preached the kingdom of God, and he's turned the spiritual landscape of that day totally upside down. While he was a friend of publicans and sinners, I mean, they came to him, the rough-cut crowd. They came to Christ, and, and he was known by his opposition as a friend of publicans and sinners. And while he was known as that, he was opposed on every hand by the religious leaders. By the way, let me say, I, I don't. I, my my uh, my goal is not for us to be religious. I, my goal is for us to be close to Christ. They sought to trap him in his words. They sought to discredit him, and they sought to find occasion to put him to death. 
in this first part here, verse 31, let's look again. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. Now these Pharisees, they were trying to find a reason to kill Christ. And now they're coming and saying, hey, you better get out of here or Herod, you're in Herod's territory now, this area of Galilee, and, and you better get out of here because if you don't, he's going to kill you. Now why would these men even care, these that wanted to kill Christ? We see a false concern here. I believe it was an attempt to frighten Jesus, to leave this region of Galilee Remember, the Jews were seeking occasion to kill him. He is now in Herod's territory. If they could but get him to Jerusalem, they would have a much easier time of, uh, of executing this death sentence upon Christ. But we see here in verse 32, the first part, we see this purpose uh, of Christ, this resolve of Christ where he says, and he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. He's saying, Look, you go tell Herod, that fox. He was known as a wily, manipulative man. He said, You go tell him, Look, I'm healing people, I'm curing people, I'm casting out devils, I'm going to be doing this a few days, I'm not bringing him any harm, and then he won't have to worry about me anymore. Just a few more days, and my, my uh, uh, purpose here will be done. But I want us to know something, notice something here interesting about Christ. We've seen a few times as we're studying the book of Luke. I want us to notice his strong language here. In verse number 32 at the very beginning, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox. Now, there's a time for strong language. He, he wasn't saying this. This wasn't a compliment here. He's, a, he's talking about Herod's character. He says, you go tell that old fox. You go tell that sly one, that manipulative one, that one who does things behind the scenes. Listen, sometimes we think that as a Christian, we're supposed to be just as soft and, and almost fearful and that we're not to, to voice anything that may offend in any way. But look, there is a time for strong language, and there is a time for stern looks. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, he had just healed a man. And in healing the man, they began to accuse him and condemn him because he had healed on the Sabbath. And look what it says, or listen to what it says in Mark 3, 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto them, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. So these that were being critical of Jesus, saying, Oh, he's going to heal this man on the Sabbath. Then we have him. All that made him angry, and he looked on them with anger. In Luke chapter 9, verse 55, the disciples they said, well, uh, this town wouldn't receive us here. Uh, why don't, do you want us to call down fire on them like Elijah did? And the Bible says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. In Matthew uh, 16, 23, listen to the words he uses to Peter here. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to, unto me. For thou savorest not the things of, that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, look, for the Savior, the Son of God, to look at you and call you Satan, that's not a good thing. That's pretty strong language that he's using with Peter right here. In John chapter 2, verse 15, we see this display uh, from Christ. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the money changers and over uh, money uh, poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. So here we find the house of God, the temple, being used for something that God never intended for it to be used for by those who should have known better. And we find our Savior now 
make a scourge, make a whip, and drive them out and rebuke them and say, this is not right. In our Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. This is Paul speaking here. And Peter, who had been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and the, the, the Jews thought, man, you shouldn't do that. He had been preaching it to them. Why? Because Jesus Christ came for every one of us, folks. But when the Jews came, Peter separated himself from them because, well, I'm scared of what they'll think if they see me hanging around the, the Gentiles over here. So Paul, when he saw him, he said, I got in his face about it because it wasn't right. Now look, as Christians, we are to follow Christ's example. As a Christian, that word means Christ-like. I want to be like Christ. Anybody else in here want to be like Christ? Oh, I fall short every day, but I want to be. And we're to follow his example. And, and that example includes compassion, being tender-hearted, yes, being meek. But he wasn't weak, our Savior was. He was meek, but he was not weak. And though we're called to be compassionate and tender-hearted and meek, we are not called as Christians to be fearful and weak. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the Word of God says this, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. In Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. As our nation continues to drift further from God, Christians must be faithful to speak the truth in love to speak the truth in love. well preacher uh, uh, that didn't sound too loving when the Savior looked at Peter and said get thee behind me Satan let me tell you something the Savior loved Peter more than we'll ever imagine or understand and he knew the kind of man Peter was look okay how many of you have more than one child okay how many of you would agree with me your children are not alike. Look, man, I have some of mine. There's one in particular of mine that if I'm upset and I'm trying to be serious with them, I'll look at them with a, a stern look. And there's the reaction I get. Trent, man, I can look at, I can be upset about something. And I'll, look, I'll get up close to him, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, hey, son. And I'll, I'll, I'll get serious, and he'll say, oh, what's so funny? Dad, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just the face you're making. It, it's making me laugh. Trent doesn't respond like that. He, he doesn't respond to the stern look. He <laughs> Carson, on the other hand, now Trent, he responded well growing up to the whooping. He responded well to that. All right? All right? Carson, on the other hand, Trent always says, he don't get near as many whoopings as I did because he's a better kid. <laughs> Not with Carson. Man, he's tenderhearted. All I have to do is say, hey, boy. I mean, it, his heart is broken. With Carson, I break his heart. With Trent, I had to break other parts of the body, okay? <laughs> no, the backside. No, look, they respond differently. Peter was this, this rough, tough fisherman who his answer to things was, let's pull out the sword, let's, let's fight. Peter, we, we find him at, at the end where he's denying Christ, actually, denying him and, and swearing when he does it. And so the Lord realized, look, this is what Peter's going to respond to. As a matter of fact, we find him talking that way with Peter more than any of the others. 
as our nation continues to drift further from Christ, look, we as Christians must be faithful to speak the truth, but in love. Our society has sought to redefine words that have been sacred words uh, 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 for hundreds of years, thousands of years, so that immorality can be, uh, be made to seem something that is natural. Morality is being abandoned in our nation. Morality is being taken out of places where the next generation is developing its, its values. Just recently, our president made a decree, and that's not a law, but he made a decree that all public schools should start letting their students use the bathroom of whatever gender they identified with. Hey, listen, folks, it, if you take the Bible and set it totally away from this, okay, that defies common sense. For, for ages, there's been a distinction drawn between the male and the female. But those definitions are being changed uh, of those sacred words so the immorality can be made to seem natural. America is being given over more and more to moral corruption. And Christians, listen Christians, being like Christ doesn't mean we, we're just to walk around and say, okay, okay. No, look, we, we must not sit back and remain tight-lipped out of fear of offending someone. Now, I don't want to, to Dr. Hiles used to say, I don't want to offend them by my disposition. But if my position offends them, well, that's another thing altogether. Look, if the truth offends, I still have to tell the truth. And I don't have to, I don't know that very often, it would be very few times that you see Jesus rebuking the sinful. You find him doing that to the religious crowd that knows better. We must realize that there is a time for strong language. Now, strong language. Let me define that. I don't mean vulgar language. Never once will you find our, our Savior, though he used strong language, you'll never find him using vulgar language. Never. You'll never find him using language that was inappropriate. But you do find him standing on the truth of God's word. And by the way, Christians, develop some thick skin. Uh, look, if my brother or sister, or sister uses strong language with me or a stern look with me, maybe I'm at fault like we saw Peter and Paul there, then I shouldn't let that wash me out or cause me to crumble. You weigh it all out. And if, if what my friend tells me has truth to it, then man, I should be thankful even though I didn't like it. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are, deceit, are, are deceitful. And if my friend was wrong when they used that strong language or that stern look, then I ought to forgive them. We never find Jesus, as I said, using language that is inappropriate, vulgar, or careless. But we do find him standing strong on what is right. And Christians, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, if I'm going to be like Christ, yes, I must be a friend of publicans and sinners because, look, I'm no better than they. As a matter of fact, I is one, am one, are one. I'm something. All right? I'm a sinner just like anybody else. Can't look down my long religious nose at them. I'm to be a friend of publicans and sinners, but I'm, to to I'm supposed to stand on the truth. And when the world use a strong language towards us to criticize the values that we hold dear from the Word of God. And by the way, if it's something you hold dear, it needs make sure it's from the Word of God, not just something you've always done. And when the world uses strong language, don't let that re, uh, topple your resolve to do right or to speak the truth. Our Lord warned us it was going to be this way. In Matthew 5, 11, listen to what he says. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you 
and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, look, this is going to happen. If they criticized the Savior, they sought to kill the Savior. And what was he guilty of? Here's what he was guilty of. He was guilty of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, uh, being a friend of publicans and sinners, healing the, uh, the deaf, healing the blind, raising the dead, and preaching the kingdom. Any of that sound bad? No. And yet they persecuted him. They criticized him. So he says, look, this is going to happen to you too if you do like I do. But then we see his determination in verse 32 and 33. Once again, he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day, and I shall, uh, third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Here's what he's saying. They say, hey, you better get out of here. Herod's going to kill you. And he says, hey, look, I'm going to continue doing what I'm supposed to do for now. <clears throat> and I'm going to continue doing it today and the third day. And after that, I'll be finished with what I set out to do. He's saying, I'll be here for a little while. I'll be here a little longer. And, and while I, I'm here, I'm going to do my father's work. No message, good or bad, was going to allow Jesus Christ to get off track. He was healing. He was casting out devils. He wasn't breaking any laws. And he would not be deterred from his uh, objective even by a threat of death. Now listen, Christians, we must also have some resolve. We, you know, we live in a, a very weak society, don't we? Well, I can't say this, it may offend somebody. Can't say that, can't do this, it may offend somebody. Well, I can't wear red socks, that may offend the red sock people. I can't wear white socks because I'll offend the white sock people. We need to toughen up as Christians. And when things don't go our way, that doesn't mean that we retreat and hide. No, what do we do? We just continue doing what is right. Then we see this compassionate cry. Look in verse number 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. He looks out towards Jerusalem. Never before had an earthly city been shown so much heavenly care. It was here that God had chosen for his anointed to dwell. It was here that God had the kings rule over his chosen people. It was here that the people were compelled to come to offer their sacrifice and to worship. It was here in this city of Jerusalem that the visible presence of God had rested at one time. It was here in this city of Jerusalem that God's prophets had compelled His people to repent. Jerusalem, over and over, God had stretched out His arms and He had called to them, Repent! Turn to me. I want to be your father and you be my children. I want to be your God and you be my people. And yet as often as he had beckoned to them, they had that often refused their God. What an expression of a deep desire to save from ruin the worst of men. The unwilling, the rebellious, the obstinate willing to save to the very last. Look, you look all through the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years. Just the time in between the, the Testament was, I think, around 400 years. 
And all that time God had been calling to his people, look, repent, turn to me. And any time he allowed another nation to, to, to uh, overthrow Jerusalem and Israel and Judah, it was because he wanted the people to turn back to him. And they would turn back for a short time. And then once again in their obstinacy, they would turn from God and, hey God, we're going to do it our way. We're going to do what we think is right in our eyes. And instead of just saying, that's it, I'm done with you, God would say, please turn back to me. Here now, hundreds, even thousands of years after Jesus, the Savior, he's looking over Jerusalem and he says, Jerusalem, and how often I've beckoned to you, how often I've called to you, how often I would have gathered you, my children, to me as a hen gathers its brood up under its wings. A sinner's sin cannot destroy the Savior's willingness to save. You say, well, man, I, that person there, they're too far gone. Oh, no, 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 no. He's a long-suffering God. And though Jesus was heading to his death, the tragedy was not to be his. The tragedy was to be Jerusalem's. And in that verse 31, he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He said, you have been my people. <clears throat> I've sent my prophets to you to, to beg you to turn back to me, and you killed them. I just wanted to be your father. I wanted to be your God. I wanted to gather you close to my side, <clears throat> and you would not. Now Jesus says, basically, the time for long-suffering is over. The door is shut. Your house will be left desolate. He says, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The blessing, he was saying, will not return until they recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. And by the way, that will happen one day. Not only with Israel, but with America and every other nation on this earth. One day, every knee shall bow. Listen in Romans 14, 11, For as it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess, that, uh, confess to God. Philippians 2, 10 through 11, That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus, he says to Jerusalem, he says, Oh, hey, Jerusalem, in spite of all that... In spite of all the times you turned from me and you refused my appeals and you refused my, my warnings and you refused my wooing and, and wanted to draw you close to me, in spite of that, I kept preaching out to you. But now your house is left desolate. We find in A.D. 70, we find the Romans totally destroyed Jerusalem. He said the blessing will not return until you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let me say, God's compassion still continues. David understood this well in Psalm 136. That psalm is 26 verses long. And each verse ends with these words, For His mercy endureth forever. Jeremiah understood this thing of his God's continuing compassion and his continuing mercy and his long suffering and his patience when he wrote in uh, Lamentations 3.22 It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Paul understood this when he wrote the, his first letter to Timothy in chapter 1 verse 16 where it says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first, Christ, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should be, hereafter believe on him to everlasting. 
Paul said, Jesus showed uh, his, his long suffering in me, saving me, who he called himself the chief of sinners. He was responsible for the imprisonment and the death of Christians. He was uh, uh, responsible for the breaking up of Christian families. And he said, but he even saved me, as unworthy as I am. And we see here in this passage, as Jesus says this, we see that his desire to save those who don't even want to be saved, his desire is to save them. Those who have lived wicked, wicked lives, which all of us actually have, but those who have done what we would call the worst of the worst, God says, look, I, 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 I still want to save you. What you've done has angered me. I'm angry with you, but in my grace, I offer you my love. I want to save you. But then we also see in that passage a continuing, not only compassion, but a continuing resistance. How often would God draw you close to him? But you resist. How often would God use us, but we resist? Sometimes maybe the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit prompts in our hearts and says, hey, you know, here's something I really would like you to do. Here's something I need you to do. We say, boy, I need to do that. I'll do it one day. Listen, don't resist to the point where he would say to you, your house is left to you desolate. Our nation continues to resist God. Listen, as Christians, let me encourage you, you stay strong and speak the truth. Don't hang your head, but now do it like Christ. Speak it in love. Let me say this to you, Christian. Don't resist the Holy Spirit moving on your heart to be closer to the Father. Well, I, I know I need to spend more time in my word, in the Word, but, I, I, but you know I'm just so busy. I don't know, but don't resist Him. I know I need to spend some more time talking to the Father, but I and we come up with some excuse. Well, I, need, I know that, boy, this probably doesn't please the Lord and I really ought to stop doing that, but don't resist Him. Boy, the Holy Spirit moves on our heart as we read the Word of God or, or just as we speak to Him in prayer or, or we're listening to preaching or teaching or, or just riding a lawnmower outside and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to our heart. Hey, yield to Him. Christian, Will you boldly stand, now not belligerently, there's a church out west, I don't remember the name, but they, they are just belligerent. There's nothing Christian about the way they're handling things. Not belligerent, but boldly stand and speak the truth of Christ. What we're supposed to, and by the way, that displays true love. Let me say, if you're in here and there's never been a time you've accepted Christ as your Savior, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ loves you so much that he gave his, own, his very life's blood for you. Regardless of your past, regardless of what you have done, regardless of where you have been, Jesus Christ loves you and died to save your soul. Don't resist him. Accept him. Christian, don't think, well, now, now I'm saved and I just kick it into neutral. No, no, no. As the Lord continues to try to mold us into the image of Christ, don't resist Him. Submit to Him. Yield to Him. Let Him change you. Let Him draw you close. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please. We have some going to be baptized.